Hello, I'm M.K. Davis. A long time before I uh, got involved with the Bigfooting uh, business, uh, I was involved with astrophotography, uh, astronomy. Uh, and, you know, it's I had a, a measure of success at it. A lot of trial and error, a lot of failures, but then a lot of successes. And, you know, it's, it's a field that's rather technical, and it, it's... Um, now that I've been out of it long enough, uh, quite a bit has changed. Uh, so I, but they're no longer uh, no longer the use of film uh, is in vogue. Uh, you know they use digital now, and they have some rather you know complex setups. Uh, I've recently purchased a new telescope, and and I plan to get back into astrophotography, but. I'm gonna have just gonna have to learn some new tricks. That's all there is to it, you know. So, uh, I'm in the process of uh, learning my equipment. Uh, this, what I wanted to share with you is, is some of my um, my work that I did prior to getting into Bigfoot, uh, and this was uh, with the use of film and a 17 and a half inch Newtonian telescope with a clock drive and a guide scope and that sort of thing, you know. And uh, you know, up above all of our heads is, you know, uh, uh, just a plethora of objects that uh, just absolutely amaze you. Uh, here's just a few samplings of them, you know, and they're within the reach of people like me. If you want to dig, uh, you know, I, and, I, and I guess maybe because I learned to dig uh, in... In astronomy and I learned you know how to use my equipment and how to take good photos and how to uh, clarify them and everything and, and how this uh, you know sort of was able to transfer that over to the big footing business and uh, the Patterson film in particular uh, and enjoy some measure of success uh, you know it it, uh, it teaches a person something uh, and you know, uh, since I'm re-entering the astronomy world, um, I'm going to, you know, you know, uh, have to get back into a business where it's run. Everything is run very differently. Uh, so, you know, it's it's astronomy is in some ways like Bigfooting. It's a lot of speculation, but then it's got you know hard science, and it's not as much in doubt. Uh, you know, uh, somebody uh, uh, uses you know, digital enhancement in order to, uh, in order to clarify an image uh, it, that doesn't raise all kinds of red flags, you know, like it does in Bigfooting. And no one's asking, no one's raising the bar so high or asking impossible things of someone. I hope that I can pick up where I left off, uh, although I know it's going to take some time. But uh, I'm looking forward to get back into astronomy, producing uh, uh, some a good product, uh, some very good and uh, stellar photographs. I'm very proud of the work uh, that I've done in the Bigfooting uh, genre, uh, especially with the Patterson film. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a, I'm a technician basically, uh, and and I wanted to clear it up. Uh, not a PhD, not a scientist. Um, or anything like that. I, I'm, if you want to say that I have a PhD, it, it stands for pretty hard-working dude. Uh, I, I'm hard-headed, and I'll stay at it if I think that I can improve it. Uh, and so, you know, I, I brought that to the table. I brought my astronomy skills to the table. Uh, and now, maybe, maybe I can take some something things that I've learned in the Bigfoot business and uh, and take them back to the astronomy world, uh, and and see perhaps if, if that doesn't you know help me somewhere along those lines in a less controversial business. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to share some of my, my work with you. So here we go, let's start. Uh, let's take a look. Here's a great galaxy in Andromeda, M31. Uh, one of the, uh, it's actually a naked eye object. Uh, it's really uh, a stunning sight through a telescope. Here is the uh, M42, the great nebula in Orion, in Orion's uh, sword. Actually, uh, I took this photo back in 1987, uh, and I mean you can see it's a very stunning 
you know, object uh, when photographed, but through the with the naked eye or, or through the telescope, there's not enough light to see the colors. So you see kind of just a dimly lit object. Uh, this is about a 20 minute exposure. This great, uh, this great nebula is about 1500 light years away, about 55 light years across. Uh, uh, in other words, the, the, the image was 1500 years old when I took it. Uh, it's a stellar nursery. Uh, um, stars are in the heart of the thing. Uh, uh, they're the engine driving it. Uh, the radiation from those stars are, is irradiating hydrogen gas and oxygen. Uh, hydrogen gas, when it's irradiated, uh, it's ionized, it glows red. Uh, the oxygen, on the other hand, when it becomes irradiated or ionized, it glows green. So you see in the nebula itself a, a mix of those two colors plus blue reflection nebula, which is just light reflecting off dust clouds. So you got kind of a mixed bag there in the Orion Nebula. It's, nebula. it's, it's one of the, uh, the showpieces uh, of, of the universe uh, and a stunning object. And uh, this is an object close by uh, the Orion Nebula, actually. It's a very stunning object as well. Uh, you'll notice when I zoom in, you'll see a line going across the front of it, and that's a satellite trail that uh, this is a timed exposure and the satellite just happened to come by that about that time. Uh, this object too it also is a reflection nebula. Uh, that's why it has this blue uh, uh, color to it. It's, uh, it's generally white light from the stars reflecting off of dust uh, so that you can see it. And there's a lot of nebula out there that's not illuminated at all and it's called dark matter. Well, we can't discuss that right now, but it's all interesting. This object is called the Horsehead Nebula. If you look in the lower right hand corner, you'll see the outline of a, uh, or the shadow, uh, in the shape of a horse's head. Uh, and as well as a number of other objects in this area. This is uh, you know, found in the constellation of Orion. Um, and it's just uh, a very, very beautiful object. Uh, but very faint. The Horsehead Nebula, actually, I can't even see it through my telescope. It, has to, it can only be observed photographically with, with what I have. But uh, it's, it certainly makes for a stunning photograph. This is probably a 25 to 30 minute exposure uh, on uh, Royal Gold 1000 Kodak film. Uh, this object right here is called the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, it's found in Ursa Major. Uh, and it's, it's uh, actually uh, the result of a collision of two different galaxies uh, and you know some of the higher resolution really big scopes can actually pierce the nucleus and, and see you know, this it's in the shape of a uh, figure eight. Uh, it's a, it's a mer the emergence of two different galaxies into one. So uh, you know uh, it, it's a um, uh, uh, it's it's part of the the Messier catalog. Uh, M51. Uh, the M stands for Messier. It was a Frenchman named Louis Messier, who uh, who wanted to eliminate uh, objects uh, as he was looking mostly for comets. So he s decided to catalog all the objects that that he constantly encountered while he was scanning the skies for comets, and, and he made a catalog of over a little over 100 objects. Uh, I believe it's a little over 100 objects, and, and, and he gave them number designations. And this was M51 and M52 for the little smaller galaxy uh, off just off from there. Uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy is a, it's a little harder object to take an uh, image of, though it's got rather low surface brightness. But, uh, you know, this was with a, a large scope, and, 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 and it took about maybe 25, 30 minutes with a 1,000 speed film to get this photograph. This right here is the Ring Nebula, uh, and it's a you know rather hard object to find uh, in the sky. It's in the constellation of Lyra, uh, and it kind of sits out there by itself. You kind of have to learn to star hop. At least I did in in the days you know when I had my, sco my big scope, uh, and I I learned I hopped from object to object, and you know my just mental catalog of where these objects were you know just got better and you know over a period of time. So I was able to you know find these objects but it is really a hard object to find it's actually got a little star in the center and that little star you know although it's not resolved here uh, better scopes and better images can see it and and it's it, it actually kind of puffs out and blows this giant smoke ring and then it turns right back goes back to being a star again uh and and, it, and what you see is the, the debris field uh it's just like a big gigantic smoke ring but of other stuff 
This right here is a comet Levy. It was named after the astronomer, uh, the amateur astronomer, David Levy, who is more famously known for his uh, discovery of the comet that slammed into Jupiter. But uh, he's a discoverer of quite a few comets, and this was one of the ones, you know, prior to that, uh, to that famous uh, impact comet. Uh, and, and it got up to a fifth magnitude, uh, which was, you know, on the borderline of being able to see it with a naked eye. This is a timed exposure, but, you know, uh, a fifth magnitude is, like I said, on the borderline. Then as you go down, it gets brighter and brighter, and, and you go down one degree uh, to a, from a fifth to a fourth and one number, and, and it gets quite a bit brighter. Uh, so, you know, it's... it's uh, 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 one, it was it was quite an object in the sky at the time that it came by, but of course some spectacular comets have come by since, and uh, it, it ends up being a footnote. Now this right here is Comet Hayakutake. Uh, it came by sometime in the 90s. I can't remember the exact year, but uh, it, it, I think it made it down to like a third magnitude. I mean, it was really bright, and, and a very large extended object. You can see how far across the... Uh, the tail goes across the frame there. Uh, if you look over in the lower right, you'll see a tree, so you get an idea of how really large this object was. Uh, and and uh, it, it was one of the more spectacular sights that I've ever seen, and, and, and I caught it on a good clear night and got this picture here. Uh, a comet is, you know, like a dirty snowball, it's described. It's, it's full of uh, ice, uh, of different, uh, not just water, but other elements uh, in their ice form. And when they get near the sun, and the, 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 the radiation from the sun warms it and, and sort of strips it away, and it becomes a vapor trail. And then it catches the brilliant sunlight and, and it forms this tremendous tail. Uh, and some, some comets have distinctive colors, you know, green, blues, and all kinds of things like that. And this was one, a really bright blue one. Very beautiful. I'm going to round out my tour with a, uh, an image of Saturn, and this was taken with just a little small scope, uh, a six-inch scope. I mean, the resolution is not that great, but, you know, uh, Saturn is still a very interesting object, and, and just to see that kind of symmetry out there in the space, it, it uh, you know, the, the solar system is an amazing thing anyway. Uh, you know, with all the planets circling around the sun, they, they say that if the planets were not there, the sun would spin out of control and self-destruct. It, it's like a regulating system. You know, with all of those planets, you know, spinning around at different rates, different amounts of pull on different sides, that it actually regulates the spin of the, of the, of the sun itself, at least and that's what they say. So, uh, you know, it's, it's all fascinating stuff, and it just seems to be, you know, no end to what you can learn about, you know, things from, by observing, you know, what's out there in space. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed these photographs as much as I have, and, and, and I enjoyed taking them, and I look forward to taking, you know, some more with the in digital equipment that I bought. So uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, and also look forward to more Bigfooting stuff. Uh, that, that they say there's a lot of good stuff to come, and I, I hope that, that that's correct. At any rate, uh, uh, thank you for your time.